whatever the topics were, this is how I organize my footage so I can best analyze it and understand it to be able to make an edit. And I took those topics and turned what was just an interview with one person into a conversation between mm. multiple people. And so that's been the success of the book because that really, it revealed things to me that even though I did the interviews, I'm like, seeing these back to back is really powerful. Hey, Against the Tide Media viewers. Welcome to Talking Back with Tara and Barb. I'm Tara. And I'm Barb. Barb. We're here this week at the Christian Worldview Filmmakers Guild and Film Festival. And we are so happy to be talking with Steve Holfish. Steve is the editor of numerous faith-based feature films like War Room, Courageous, and Overcomer. Steve is also the author of six popular books on color grading and editing. Steve, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, you are multi-talented, Steve. Can you tell us what you do? Uh, um, primarily, I think of myself as an editor. That's what I want to be known as. That's where I think my greatest skill set is. Um, obviously, I do writing books and I do interviewing just like you ladies. So um, I feel like part of the team. Awesome. And um, I do color correction. So I've written a couple of books on color correction and I've done you know, color graded films and TV shows, but um, that's not where I really feel like my gifts are. And so I'm trying to focus more on editing, but yeah, that's basically it. I, I was hoping to have the chance to direct this summer, um, but COVID has killed a $5 million movie oh. out from under me. So wow. not happy. No, goodness me. How did you get your start? Um, my start, I started out um, in as a musician and as a photographer. And so editing seemed to be kind of the great combination of music and pictures. So um, I transitioned, I kind of realized that I'm not the greatest musician in the world. So those skills have kind of gone to being more of a hobby and uh, my photography skills, I, I still love taking pictures, but um, basically it's the combination of those things. And I uh, made a documentary when I was in college that won a national award. Yeah. And at the award ceremony, somebody said, we would love to hire you. And so I went, moved to Chicago immediately after leaving college and worked for Oprah for a decade and worked for a couple of uh, Bill Curtis. I don't know if you know who he is, big national news uh, guy. He was in uh, Anchorman, the movie Anchorman. Uh, he yeah. narrates the beginning of Anchorman. And uh, he does documentaries and worked for him for a while, too. Well, Steve, we... And Veggie Tales. Yes, forgot about yes, Veggie Tales. Absolutely. Can't forget about Veggie no, Tales. Not that's, with this crowd. That's right. Yeah. Have we got a show for you. My kids cut their teeth on Veggie <laughs> yeah. Tales. Probably literally on the cassettes, right? <laughs> Nine, right? That's great. Steve, I want to jump right into this. I listened to you speak yesterday and became very intrigued. So mm -hmm. can you tell us some about the books you've authored? Uh, the books I've authored, the one, you know, as, as maybe you guys are moms, right? You, you don't have a favorite child. You're not supposed to. <laughs> I have a favorite child. I, I, all the other books are probably jealous of the golden child. The golden child is this one, Art of the Cut. It's the one I'm most proud of. It's the one I feel like I did the best work on um, of my six. Uh, it's the most recent. And I'm trying to do volume two right now. Ooh. So um, uh, it's basically, um, at the time, I'd only interviewed 50 editors, but they were some of the editors of the world's biggest movies. They were Oscar winners. They were Emmy winners. Every TV show you've ever seen, every, you know, big movie, Titanic, Avatar, just name the movie. And uh, I've interviewed those guys. And But I'd read a bunch of other books on editing that were just interviews and you would just see one person's thoughts compiled. It would just be an interview with that one person. And then the next chapter was an interview with the next person, and the next per interview was an interview with the uh, next chapter was an interview with the next person. And I thought, you know what? What would be better for the audience is if it was arranged in topics, mm -hmm. and then each editor spoke to that topic, and you're only getting a paragraph. So what I did was I figured, what are the topics that are most important to me as an editor? And then I went through 500,000 words, a half a million <laughs> words of interview, transcribed interviews, and said, okay, this guy is talking here about pacing and timing. This guy is talking about rhythm. This guy is talking about judging the performance of an actress. This guy is talking about, or a woman is talking about how I deal with a director, how my relationship with a director works. This person is talking, you know, whatever the topics were, this is how I organize my footage so I can best analyze it and understand it 
to be able to make an edit. And I took those topics and turned what was just an interview with one person into a conversation between multiple people. And so that's been the success of the book because that really, it revealed things to me that even though I did the interviews, I'm like, seeing these back to back is really powerful. So um, I love that. And then also in the book, every page has a little call out of like what I think is the golden little nugget of yeah. this is this is the sentence on this page that this is going to mean something to you. So every every page has a little like bigger, bolder type that says one sentence. So it's easy to just kind of leaf through and go, oh, that's great. I got to remember that. I like that. Yeah. And if a person wanted to obtain this book. What Amazon, is easiest way. Excellent. Yep. Yep. So are they used in, in film schools? They are used in film schools. Yep. All my books are used in film schools. All of my books have been translated into multiple languages. So if you're Chinese, you can get it in Chinese. If you're, uh, I just sold it in Japan. You can get a Japanese version. You can get uh, Vietnamese, I've seen. I, um, I'm trying to get Spanish, but it had, no one's bought it in Spanish yet. Um, multiple languages. Oh, that's super. And tell us a little about your... Um, your the color grading book? The you, color grading book is that? another one that, that it's almost the same idea. Um, what happened was it, it actually was kind of born out of my, um, I don't know, being embarrassed <laughs> for writing one. The first book I ever wrote was the first book ever on color correction. No one had ever written a book on color correction before back in the early 2000s. And I wrote a book on it. And when I wrote it, and I published it, and I felt bad because I'm like, I am not the expert on this topic. I'm like the lowest level person that has understanding of this topic. And yet I wrote the book and I felt really bad about that. I'm like there's tons of people that should have written this book. Um, so what I did was at the time, you know, to, to do color correction, you had to be in a million dollar color correction suite. So you just couldn't carry that around the, the nation with you. Mm. But just at that time, a really good color grading system had the, you know, came about that I could move from one city to another. And so I actually traveled to LA, to Miami, to Philadelphia, to New York City, to Chicago, and interviewed the best colorists in the, in the nation. And I would sit down with them and watch them grade the same images. So very rarely do you get to see one image graded by a bunch of different people, right? Or edited or like anything. It's like cover songs where you're like, oh man, that guy, I love that, that version of that song. So we watched multiple people grade the same image. And while they were doing it, I'd be like, oh, what are you doing? Are you looking at this? You know, why are you choosing to do that? What's this about? And they would explain what they were doing while they were grading the image. So my color correction book, which is the art and technique of color correction, digital color correction, is 13 different uh, colorists walking through their process of color grading images. That would be definitive, wouldn't it? <laughs> so, so, and what I'm proud about both those books is it's not my knowledge. So many times you read a book and it's one person's opinion. My books, you're getting 50 different opinions or 12 different opinions. And sometimes they're not, they don't agree. agree. And that's really powerful because you can go, oh, you know what? In my intuition or the way I think, I agree with this person and not this person. Oh, great. Okay. Or you can see all the agreements and you go, okay. Clearly, all 12 of these people think the same thing. That's the way it should be done. Yeah. That's great, Steve. Thank you for that information. Sure. Mm -hmm. Now, not only are you an author, mm -hmm. but you also spoke to editing. Can you uh, speak mm -hmm. to us about that? Sure. Um, I love editing. I love the power of it. I think um, it, the one ego that I will show is I think the editor is probably the most powerful collaborator that the director has. It's mm -hmm. probably the most important person on a movie set other than the director because you're there the longest and you can have the most impact. Everybody's work flows through you. Mm. You've got a great actor, you've got a great actress. I loved you know, working with Cameron Arnett on mm. Overcomer or Sherry Rigby. They deliver beautiful, beautiful performances, but I can destroy those performances or I can enhance those performances. That's powerful. And I can take the best work of the camera department or the worst work of the camera department, all those things, and really, there's so many ways to shape the story in editing. It's something that's very um, interesting to me. And obviously, I've spent uh, uh, the last six years exploring that with a lot of almost 300 of the world's best editors. Mm -hmm. So speaking on the editing process, does the process begin while the movie is still being shot? Or it really should be. There's been a couple of Christian films that I've worked on where they call me after everything's shot. And it's really to their disadvantage to do that. Um, there's a couple of reasons why you want to do it with the editor there. Um, 
the main one being the sooner the editor can start working, the faster you can get your film into the theaters and get your investment back, right? Or if you're a Christian filmmaker and you're like, I want to affect the world, I want to have people come to Jesus, do you want to do that later or do you want to do that sooner, right? You know, so um, if you've got the editor working from the very first day of production, you're going to have a jump start on that process. The other reason why it's really valuable is because an editor can say to the director, um, I think there's something missing. And yes. before you leave the location or before they strike a set and maybe have to come back to it and cost mm -hmm. tens and tens of thousands of dollars to have to come back to reshoot, the editor can go, I think I'm missing this important close-up or I really wish I had a two shot that looked like this. I think that would be super valuable. This is the reason why I think we need the shot. And the director can go, yeah, I agree with you. Okay, let's, let's get that before we leave. Mm -hmm. um, or if there's a mistake, I, I pointed out on a, on a film that a camera uh, dolly move from one position to another was supposed to be able to cover an actress speaking a series of lines. And when I saw it, I'm like, I don't think you can say all those lines in that amount of time. And sure enough, you know, I read them while I watched the camera move and you couldn't get through half. So I had to go to the director and say, we need to stop. You know, before we leave, we have to reshoot this whole scene because we need this camera move to be twice as long as it is. So those are the kind of things that if you have an editor working as the production is going on, you can solve that problem. Because otherwise, you, you get home and go, no, <laughs> why are you ruined this perfect shot? What do I do? You know, Are you on set then or do they send I'm you? I'm near set. Okay. So, um, and I've been on some movies that actually have me literally on set. I've been... You know, in the house they're shooting in. I was, you know, on, on War Room, I was in the house of Priscilla Shire and wow. T.C. Stallings. I was in the basement, basically, a beautiful basement, an appointed basement. Mm -hmm. But um, I was in the basement and they were shooting directly above me. Sometimes I'm in a trailer that's, you know, if they're on location, I'm in a trailer near set. But it's very um, limiting to do that. And so I usually try to be in a spot where I can sit, like, like a room like we're in now, and go, I'm just going to stay here. You're only a couple miles away. <laughs> And this way I can stay in one place. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm near set. You spoke of Overcomer. Mm -hmm. And we enjoyed so much the special features at the end. <laughs> yeah. I think four days later, you know, the kids were like, you got to watch this. Or I was telling the kids to watch this. And part of that was some of your handiwork. So do you want to speak of that? Oh, sure. Um, there's a lot. The, the Kendrick brothers, I have to give all credit to the Kendrick brothers. They love their bonus features. And most I of those, love it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Those guys are just genius with that stuff. And to be able to give that to the audience, to, you know, something special, you know, like the movie's enough, right? But um, to have all these bonus features is all their idea. My favorite, of course, which they've been doing since long before I've been on with the movies, is this, at, um, you know, War Room in 60, Fireproof mm -hmm. in 60. So that's all their idea. And, of course, they shoot those while they're filming the actual yeah, scenes. So think way ahead. They've got to think way ahead. They're, they're all written way ahead. And sometimes they'll add one or something or they'll miss one. But it doesn't really matter, you know. And so I get these little War Room in 60 little nuggets while I'm editing the film. I'm like, oh, that's funny. And then, okay, now i got to get back to work, you know, kind of thing. So um, those are fun to edit. And then we did one, and I can't quite remember the genesis of it. I actually think that it was Stephen's young son, Stephen Kendrick's son, um, Grant. And Grant, um, I can't remember the word. I did the first one, and Grant did it. You know, I gave him the idea, and then Grant took it and ran with it. But I think I was watching that scene where Alex first meets Cameron. Uh, I can't remember his name, the character's name, Cameron's character mm -hmm. uh, in the hospital bed. Thomas Hill. And there was just something where I like I got a glimpse of like, oh, it would be funny if I put this line with this line because they're not supposed to go together. And then I would, you know, oftentimes after the, the evening shoot was over and Alex is exhausted, you know, just to be a director on mm -hmm. a film set is exhausting. But he would come to my edit, you know, cutting room at night after dinner. And it was just kind of his respite to go like, oh, man, no <laughs> pressure's off of me. You know, let's see what some of the handiwork and let's see what some of the people have done. And he would come in. And so oftentimes, instead of showing him the real scene, I would go, oh, yeah, you know, tell me what you think of this. And I would play and it would all the lines would be out of order. And he'd go, oh, my God, you know, so he'd laugh. And, and so we thought, wouldn't it be funny if we did 
an entire thing where the editor had complete control. <laughs> you know, don't mess with the editor because I can make you look bad or I can make you look good. And let me just prove it here. So we did this very funny don't mess with the editor sequence, which I think in reality, the whole et sequence was edited by Grant, which is Stephen Kendrick's wow. son, who mm -hmm. just, just heading off to college this year. That's impressive. Yeah. Excellent. Another part of that I liked was the wall that they refer to that was kind of your um, mind idea. Well, yeah, I, again, I, I, it was my idea on Overcomer. It's certainly not my idea in the world of film. Um, I've stolen that. Many editors do that. Walter Murch, who's a very famous editor, he edited Apocalypse Now. He edited the Godfather movies. Um, he has a wall of images that he puts up while he's editing. There's a, just a wall of stills from hmm. the movie that he keeps so that he can look over and kind of get an idea of yeah. where he is in the film. And I said, well, we should do that. So we took um, a still. Once again, it was something I handed off to Grant to do. I'm like, Grant, go through every scene in the movie and pull one representative frame and give me that frame. And then, believe it or not, I took him to Walgreens. I <laughs> sent him, I, I went up on the Walgreens website and I posted all of the images. Not something you could do if you were cutting a Marvel movie, probably would give away the entire film, but they didn't know what they were getting. So I went and I went to Walgreens and I picked up 170 stills, mm -hmm. you know, cost us about 40 bucks. And um, I'd done them in Photoshop. So it was a photo. It was an image of the straight out of the movie uh, grab. And then at the bottom, it said what the scene number was and a brief description of the scene, you know, camera in the hospital bed or something mm -hmm. like that. And then a little blank space at the bottom where we did various things. We would say we had color coding. So um, is this a is this emotional, powerful scene? Is this a funny scene? Is this an action scene? And we would have color codes so that we would be able to look up on the wall and go, oh, look, there's a bunch of sad scenes in a row that people will be depressed if, if all these sad scenes stay together. We should stick a happy scene in the middle or something like that. Or it would just say, Bill, Bill has to edit the scene, you know, Bill Ebel or Alex is editing this scene or Steve is editing this mm -hmm. scene. We would just write those things. And as we were doing the movie, we also knew the movie was too long. And you could shorten every single scene, but that would remove the power of every single scene. So what we found was some scenes had to go. And even some really powerful scenes, like if you look in the, in the deleted scenes, there's scenes that you go, why did they cut this scene? And that's one of those scenes that the editor and the director clearly have to do is say, this is a great scene. I loved shooting it. It has a powerful message, but it just doesn't help propel the story along. And so we would cut them out. And as we cut them out, we would take them off the wall. And then you'd see a hole and then you're like, now does that scene and that scene go together? Now that this scene's not in the middle, oh, it doesn't. What do we do now? Th these two scenes have to go side by side. Well, maybe if we pulled this scene from over here and stuck that in the middle, that would help. So that was a lot of what we were doing. And also so much of editing is just talking, just like we're doing now. We don't sit at our keyboards. We're not looking at a screen. We're just sitting and going, oh, what do you think? What do you think? And having that wall up, we could all just sit there and look at the wall and go, oh man, look at that. What, what if we put this scene over there? And that's a lot easier than trying to do it in the editing, you know, cutting room and moving it and then watching it for 15 minutes. You can just take a still off the wall and stick it someplace else. I've got pictures of all that stuff and um, it, we use it a lot and the Kendrick brothers thanked me for that idea and they're gonna do it for all their other movies. Yeah. Previous movies, they did something similar, but it was just, they just took post-it notes and wrote the scene name on it. And the problem was you couldn't visualize it and the post-it notes always fell off the wall. <laughs> well, what's interesting, you said that you have a picture of that. I also took a picture of that, thank you, okay. uh, to send to our editor because I thought as we spoke at this moment, we could yeah, have that there. True. So, yeah. excellent. In the editing process, particularly for Overcomer, when you were co-editing with Alex and Bill, mm -hmm. um, did you each do certain scenes or did you all do all the scenes and we kind of all did all we each person just, just to get it done as quickly as possible would take one scene especially bill and i so alex while we were what's called cutting dailies so while they're shooting you're getting footage every day and alex is directing so he can't be a part of any of that so bill and i edited every single scene we split them as they came in every day maybe you'd get four scenes so i would take two scenes and bill would take two mm -hmm. scenes You'd edit that in one day, have it a rough cut done, and then at the end of the six weeks of shooting, you'd assemble it into a 
film. Alex didn't do any of that. Then he looked at our scenes as the director, and because he's an editor himself, he would go, oh, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this again. And he would edit the scenes. Alex edited every scene in the entire movie by himself. Mm -hmm. And then he would look at our cut, and he'd look at his cut, and he'd go, oh, oh, I like Steve did something really interesting here. I'm going to steal that. I'm going to incorporate Steve's, or he would take my entire scene and use mine instead of his. Or he'd go, I like mine better. Steve's is gone. Or combine them in some way. So Alex did every single scene in the movie. Um, and then the other larger thing is the things that are not just scenes. It's how do the scenes work as a whole inside the movie? And that was all of us talking and going, you know, what if we did this? What if we move these scenes? Um, do we need this scene? Does the scene get cut out? So there's additional work even once the scenes are cut, especially once you see them in context. Then you see, you, you know, you cut something and you go, oh, I, I cut that beautifully. I love the way I cut that. And then you see it with the scenes on either side of it and you go, that doesn't work. Darn it. Mm -hmm. You know, what do I do now? So then you have to revise it because of the context of the scenes around it. I feel like we could we could talk about this for a long I'm time. Sure we could. <laughs> I can talk about it for days oh, because I clearly I'm here to talk about it for days. Yeah. <laughs> well, my husband does a lot of editing of church videos mm -hmm. and my daughter and, and I, I work at church. So I see our... Um, our worship pastor does a lot of editing, and I know what a job it is, mm -hmm. and I know that, especially on a feature film, um, to take that much footage and get it down to a, a watchable yeah. amount could be, that could be totally done. The to. typical shooting ratio, so a shooting ratio is how much do they shoot compared to how much is in the final film, is usually about 60 to 1. Mm -hmm. So you're, you know, 120 hours of footage to get a two-hour movie, basically. That's it's a lot of stuff. As we wrap things sure. up, um, just a couple of fun questions we have for you. All right, let's go. So, <laughs> if you could travel anywhere in the world, where would you travel? Ooh, I could, well, I traveled to Italy, which I love. Uh, Florence is gorgeous, and I traveled to Vietnam, and mm -hmm. I love Vietnam. I recommend Vietnam to everybody that I meet. It is a lovely mm -hmm. country. It's beautiful, and the, the people that live there are very friendly. Excellent. And did you have any stay at home time or did, were you working the whole time and did you binge anything if you were at home? Um, my viewing habits are pretty secular, <laughs> um, but uh, I did, the Kendrick brothers are very concerned with family time. So we, I did while we were editing, I was in Columbus while we were shooting for six weeks. And then I was, the, the editing process took from June till March. So almost nine months. And uh, the Kendrick brothers are very concerned with family time. So every couple of weeks they would go, hey, go home, you know, you know, spend time with your wife, spend time with your kids. My kids are grown, but um, spend some time. So I did get home. Um, my viewing habits. So I love a TV show called Killing Eve. Yeah. This is really good. And I love a show called I Am Not Okay With This, mm -hmm. which is about a teen girl that realizes it's not a superhero movie, but she realizes she has superpowers, but she hates that she has superpowers. She's just like, she's like a 14 year old girl. I'm like, what do you want to do? You kind of want to blend in. You want to be like everybody else. You're like, I don't want to stand out. And she's like, I have superpowers. This is terrible. <laughs> I am not okay with this. And, and for our final question, um, for eating, we have a choice of a restaurant. Ooh, I just go? ate at, I think, Butcher Town. I love Thai food mm -hmm. and I love barbecue. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. So fun. I feel like there's so much more to talk about and learn, but thank you so much. I'll be time. back for episodes three, four, and five. All right. Done. <laughs> thank thank you. you. You're welcome. <laughs>checking out this Against the Tide media video. And you're probably asking yourself, how can I watch more great interviews? Well, you're in luck because Against the Tide media's YouTube channel has tons of great interviews. You'll find chatting with the chosen interviews, 53 questions with Raina, Zoom rooms, post interviews, and us talking back with Tara and Bart. While you're there, like this video, hit subscribe, and click on notifications so you won't miss an interview. And don't forget to like Against the Tide Media on Facebook and follow us on Instagram. Thanks again for watching.
All right. Yeah. Hey, Against the Tide Media viewers. Welcome back to Talking Back with Tara and Barb. I'm Tara. And I'm Barb. We're eating. We have a choice of a restaurant. Ooh, I just go? ate at, I think, Butcher Town here in, uh, in my, my, what well, my favorite is. What is my favorite? I'll be back for episodes three, four, and five. All right. Done. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. <laughs> Um, Oops, I always forget that I'm attached. So, um. Oops, I just unplugged. That doesn't work. All right.